Well, welcome everyone uh, to on this beautiful Friday evening or Friday morning, depending on where you are. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you on HPS TESE uh, Global Book Talk. Uh, today about uh, Natalia Alexian's book, uh, Conscious History, uh, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust. Uh, and I'm very happy that, first of all, Natalia uh, joins us from Vienna, where she's now a fellow at the uh, Imre Heritage Collect. Uh, and uh, we also have two commentators, uh, Naomi Seidman uh, from University of Toronto and Martin Bolinski from the University, University of Wrocław. Uh, and uh, if you want to learn more about our uh, uh, about our uh, speakers, you can check on Facebook or in the description of this video. And without further ado, I will now lend the floor to Natalia to present her book. Thank you, thank you, Jan, uh, and uh, thank you, Naomi, and thank you, Martin, for. Um, being here with me uh, today, and I've been um, actively following the series. Uh, so uh, it's wonderful to be uh, this time on the other side of, of this, um, not exactly barricade, of, of this intellectual table. Uh, and let me share with you, uh, just to get us started, because the book uh, is out next week or so, uh, um, just to uh, give you a taste of uh, what, what this story uh, is about and we'll uh, then um, have a conversation um, about it. So uh, the book uh, Conscious History uh, looks at uh, Polish Jewish historians as a, as a cohort. Uh, it's a collective biography, but it's also a story about uh, knowledge production, uh, knowledge dissemination, the meaning of historical knowledge uh, to uh, those writing, uh, writing it to this, those who uh, cited and, and uh, to the broader audience uh, interested in the Polish Jewish past uh, before, uh, before the Holocaust. It's also a story of um, several shifts, uh, biographical shifts of, of people writing uh, Polish Jewish history, generational shift that I will uh, touch on in a moment, a geographic shift. Here is a uh, the map of the Second Polish Republic, but the book starts in the second half of 19th century. Uh, and so there are several shifts from where the writing is actually taking place. And it is very much shifting between um, Congress Poland, uh, Warsaw and Galicia, especially uh, Lwów. It's also a shift from um, uh, history writing done by an eclectic group of uh, intellectuals who were primarily not professional historians, uh, but rather people trained in law uh, or trained as rabbis uh, and who were uh, interested in Polish Jewish past for a variety of reasons. And this eclectic group uh, in the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century included both uh, non-Jewish Poles, Polish Jews, uh, Poles of um, um, mosaic faith, as, as some of them would uh, call themselves. So just two um, faces, as it were, uh, to that story of a Polish historian, Władysław Smoleński, and a, a, a Jewish um, journalist and communal activist, uh, Hilary Hillel Nussbaum. Uh, it's a generational um, shift also from uh, the generation of, of, of intellectuals who are interested in Jewish history, but whose primary um, uh, intellectual pursuits are in other histories, especially in Polish history, and who write about the Jews as a sort of site to that uh, main interest. And so Alexander Krauschar, uh, for once, is someone who writes about Polish history, but considers Jews an important part of that history, just like, as he puts it, uh, uh, peasants are important to the giving the full 
uh, picture. Um, similarly, Shimon Ashkenazi, one of the most interesting uh, historians of the early 20th, uh, 20th century, uh, um, writing primarily about 19th century, uh, so contemporary his history as it were, uh, who is not really himself a scholar of Jewish history, but who is essential in creating um, structures such as this uh, short-lived uh, journal, the quarterly on the, on the past of Jews in Poland, such as uh, the competition that he uh, chairs uh, at the University of Lviv, Lviv Lemberg, uh, that uh, ends up being a vehicle uh, for a number of uh, important scholars whose uh, center of activities will actually be the history of Polish Jews, Meyer Bauerban, Ignacy Itzhak Schipper, and Mojesz uh, Moshe Shor. And these three so the fathers of professional Polish Jewish historiography, uh, all of those, uh, uh, those scholars had a degree, graduate degree in history. They were members of various associations that were publishing in scholarly journals in Poland, uh, Polish and, and other scholarly journals. And the focus of the book then shifts into the young generation of uh, Polish Jewish historians. Uh, Emanuel Ringelblum is probably the best known uh, of, this, uh, of this cohort because of his role as the founder creator of uh, Onek Shabbat underground archives of Warsaw uh, Ghetto. But he has an incredibly interesting uh, intellectual biography of a public intellectual and an academic historian uh, before the war with a degree from Warsaw University. What's also happening in the, those multiple shifts is the emergence of women uh, who are virtually absent uh, um, in the cohort uh, before the uh, Second Polish Republic, but, but in the 1920s and especially in the 1930s, uh, at least one third of uh, uh, students who came to study to Warsaw University to focus in their uh, work on Polish Jewish history are women. And I'm very interested in the kinds of trajectories that may have uh, led these women to take on this particular uh, profession. Women tended to enroll more in uh, humanities, um, but why, why of all possible uh, topics did they study Polish Jewish history primarily under uh, Meyer Bauerban. It's also a tension between, on the one hand, um, Polish scholars, uh, especially um, Handelsmann, uh, who are enabling and, and open to developing Polish Jewish historiography, uh, actively uh, helping uh, young scholars and seeing in this an important part of Polish historiography. Um, and on the other hand, university space becoming increasingly hostile to Jewish presence as such, including uh, Handelsmann himself, who needed to be uh, accompanied in the 1930s from the tram stop to the building where he was uh, teaching uh, because there were some uh, assaults on him as he was seen as a Jew. This point is from Polish, uh, primarily Polish um, affiliation. Um, so the, this, this, these two elements uh, shape uh, the academic uh, opportunities that uh, Polish Jewish historians may or may not have. Uh, among this uh, uh, tension uh, is also the, the result in uh, a sense of of Jewish community that they need to create their own, inst own institutions for uh, enabling the development, the flourishing of all kinds of intellectual pursuits, including Jewish history. And this is especially done uh, in that building that is now a uh, Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, but was the Institute of Judaic Studies, which opened in 1928. 
and which uh, here you have a picture of some of the students, uh, but it really brought together a very diverse group of teachers and very diverse group of students uh, from all around uh, Second Polish Republic with very um, um, diverse political views and uh, intellectual interests. Uh, this sense of the, the, the need of the Jewish community to organize itself also touches on the need for collecting sources. Um, and it's ironic that there is a sense of urgency to that collecting that we, we know that the many, many of these sources will get destroyed during the Second World War in the Holocaust, but uh, this collecting is already taking place uh, throughout the interwar period. And here is one of the calls uh, published in the Literarische Blätter signed by uh, leading uh, historians of Eastern Europe, Jewish historians of Eastern Europe, uh, including the men that I mentioned earlier and Shimon Dubnov calling on on individual Jews to collect uh, Pinkasim, to collect community uh, chronicles. Um, this uh, self-organization also leads to creating a seminar of young Jewish historians where students come together, discuss their work, um, discuss methodology, discuss sources, the kinds of things we're all used to, to do, uh, but there is a, this additional layer of a national need for self-organizing to write the community's own history. I mentioned the tension between the open-minded um, uh, Polish intellectuals and on the other hand, um, the doors that are half shut, uh, closed. Um, the, the historians that I'm writing about in my book uh, did not really have a, a chance for academic careers and they all are involved in other pursuits in which I argue their being historians actually plays a very important role. So many of them, such as Bella Mandelsberg, a historian writing on social and economic history, especially in her hometown of Lublin, uh, is a teacher in one of the uh, prestigious Jewish gymnasiums in, uh, in Lublin. And there are stories about how she engaged her students with, uh, with Jewish history, especially local Jewish history. Um, Hillel Zeidman, you see here his, um, uh, his student ID, and I'm particularly uh, honored that Naomi uh, is here with us today. Uh, this is, his, uh, this is her father's uh, student ID. So Hillel Zeidman uh, is uh, taking his historical expertise into the idea of building a professional a central archives of the history of Polish Jews in Warsaw, a project that doesn't materialize, but sign signals uh, the, the kind of ambitions that the community has for its history. And then last but not least, um, rabbis uh, utilize these historical references, historical um, knowledge, uh, and incorporate them into uh, um, sermons, teachings, in particular, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Jewish soldiers, Jewish men who are drafted into the Polish army. Last but not least, there is, of course, a question of continuity. The book ends before the Holocaust in 1939, but uh, some of those who were part of this cohort, part of this optimistic, to an extent, project of community writing its own history, either survived or left Poland before the war, and they continued uh, to, the, to a degree uh, intellectual traditions of this project uh, especially in, in Israel, um, Safrira has really taught uh, Jewish history for decades in Israel. Uh, they were authoring uh, school programs and school textbooks, but also some of the leading historians of Eastern European Jewish history, uh, Rafael Mahler, uh, Jakub Szatsky, uh, Arthur Eisenbach, whose work we know especially from post-war period, they, their intellectual roots are in the project that this book explores. Let me stop here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you, Natalia, very much uh, for this great presentation and keeping 
a great timing with 11 minutes as promised. Uh, and now, uh, since Naomi was already mentioned in your presentation, I will give the floor to uh, Naomi. Uh, this. Thank you. It is a great honor and very moving for me to be here. Um, so, and congratulations, Natalia. It's really wonderful to see this book out. It's been a while as these books tend to be. Um, so one of the things, and I'm sorry, I'm not a Polish historian or anything like that. Maybe I, I don't know. I hate when other people start by apologizing, but I guess I just did. So um, um, one, of the, one of the questions that you ask in one of the chapters is, is what kind of history did these historians do? Um, what were the topics of their dissertations? What were the approaches they took? And you mentioned political history and, and um, economic history, giving way to some extent to more local histories, like the history of Lublin that you just mentioned, more social histories, um, history of everyday life. Um, and one of the questions I asked about your book is, what kind of history is this? Um, on one level, that's a, there's a very obvious answer to that. This is um, historiography. It's a history of history, or it's intellectual history. But it also strikes me that it's um, also a history of affect, a history of um, a certain kind of mood. Um, you mentioned the optimism of the project that um, was in some ways unwarranted, though in some ways was warranted. You talk about Balaban's pride in having so many students. Um, so it's interesting to think about this as, I, I decided to try to think about this as affect history, a history of a certain kind of mood. And that goes against the title in some sense, because your title seems to say that these are historians that are particularly conscious of what they're doing. Um, on the other hand, this consciousness, I think, does come with a pretty specific um, collective affect, despite the diversity of the historians that are in this crowd. So this is how I, I would love to know whether you think I got this right. But this is how I tried to summarize the affect. The affect is a certain kind of pride that that word does come up. And the pride is um, of a kind of at-homeness, the longevity of Jewish presence in Poland, the sense that there's so much to be studying, right? All these people say, this is neglected and that is neglected and there's so much. Um, and combined with a sense that along with this at-homeness in Poland is the distinctiveness of Jews, the distinctiveness of Jewish culture. And all of this mood, if you wanna call it that, all of this emotion under pressure, increasing pressure in the 1930s, um, the double pressure of growing anti-Semitism and the pressure of um, the economic problems that make it really unlikely that most of these graduates would find positions and even finding a position as a high school teacher wasn't enough to pay the bills. So this combined double kind of pride, a kind of national in the Jewish sense and the Polish sense um, under this kind of pressure. I would say there's one other feature that's really important, I think, to this affect. And the feature is the sense of themselves as professional historians, the sense that what they were doing was now on a different level than what their precursors had been doing, that what they were doing was participating fully as historians in, on the highest academic level, working with archives, substantiating their sources. And this particular, um, stance or sense of themselves meant that affect had to be restrained, had to be governed by a certain kind of um, intellectual uh, overcoming of emotion, including the emotions of despair or rage 
or whatever it is that you would feel as a student forced to sit on a, a ghetto bench or aware that your prospects were incredibly limited. Um, so the professionalism of this group, I think is really important to understanding the affect. Um, what I would say is that for you and for me too, and I would say that this, this uh, project is so filled with emotion for me, as you know, um, I, it's hard for me every time I look at this book, I, I'm, I'm, I'm filled again with the sense of who my father was and how you explained him to me as a man who could have, right? I could have been a contender, um, but that affect is restrained for you too. Um, you as a professional historian of a different generation, say right at the outset that you're not gonna, every page isn't gonna be about this person died in the Holocaust. You're not gonna play that game. You're not gonna, you're not gonna write a book that's under the shadow of history. Um, so I'm very interested in the fact that professional historian um, affect uh, restrains emotion to some extent. And then at the very um, end of your book, you mention that among the offshoots of the Galician um, precursors to this group of mostly Warsaw-based historians is Salo Baron, who ends up in the United States and is very famous for, among other, you know, if he's known for one thing, for people who aren't, you know, deep historians, it's the non-lacrimose theory. So we have someone from this crowd who in the United States says, don't write Jewish history where it's all about suffering and persecution. Um, avoid looking at singular episodes as if they stand for the whole story. Um, and this really was part of the way these, his, his cohort, his kind of shadow cohort in Warsaw um, also treated their history. They weren't gonna be dominated by narratives of persecution, including in the present day. Um, the non-lacrimose was in some way part of their professionalism, but it was also part of their pride and their dignity. Um, so I just, if I'm allowed a question, I would just ask whether um, professional historian anti-lacrimosity, for those of you who never took a class in Jewish history, that means, you know, not crying over Jewish history. Um, is this also a kind of defense? Is this also a psychological stance and not only a professional stance? And is it, I think about, you know, one of the great works of, of, of ethic theory by Lauren Berlant, who wrote a book called Cruel Optimism. Um, were these figures too working under a kind of cruel optimism? Um, and along with everything they could see because they were professional historians, was there something they couldn't see because of the very pride of being a professional historian? Um, so that's my question to you, but I just wanna thank you again for inviting me and thank you for teaching me so much about my father. Thank you, Naomi. And uh, Natalia, do you want to respond now or do you want to respond after Martin's comment? Maybe, maybe I would respond now because uh, if Martin uh, um, uh, is okay with this, because this was uh, this was so rich, and and I know that um, um, a very full meal is coming from Martin as well. So uh, so if if possible, I would I would like to say a few uh, a few things. So uh, Naomi, first of all, thank you so much, and yes, you know how much it means to me to be in this conversation with you. Also also given uh, how important uh, your father was for me in understanding the, the complexity of, of, of this group. Um, because he stands out among um, um, left-wing Zionists who, uh, who are much more known as, as, uh, as those that were shaping this, uh, this discussion about the past. 
Uh, and I absolutely agree uh, with what you said. Uh, and I thank you for this because I, uh, you know, it kind of allows me to, uh, to reflect again on the project, on their project and, and my project in writing this book. Um, um, so I agree with everything you said in a sense that there is a, uh, there is a great sense of pride. Uh, there is a, a taking, um, but yes, a, a very consciously uh, uh, um, stressing this at homeness and uh, at home in Poland for as long as other Poles, uh, right, non-Jewish Poles, uh, might might be uh, at home. Um, and this distinctiveness uh, goes also in. Uh, that you mentioned goes in several directions because it's also a sense of proud distinctiveness of Polish jewelry, right? We are, we are, as they write, we're part of this uh, broader Ashkenazic tradition. We're part of Eastern European Jewish culture, but we're not Russian Jews, and we're certainly not German Jews. Uh, we we have our own cultural identity, and it's tied to this land, and it's tied to Poland's history. Uh, it's shaped by Poland's history, and uh, and yes, there is so much to write about, and so much to catch up with. And others who wrote about us, if I can do the collective voice here, didn't understand us. So here, Polish uh, Polish Jewish historians come not only to teach non-Jewish Poles uh, about uh, the antiquity, the importance uh, of, uh, of Jewish uh, center in Poland, but to also explain Polish Jewry to, to Russian Jewish historians and to German Jewish historians, in particular in the context of uh, Wissenschaft des Judentums, this writing about uh, 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 Jewish past and culture, which uh, tended to look down on Eastern European Jews. Uh, so all of this, uh, yes, is truly, um, um, and I think that, that this is why it resonates. Uh, and the book is uh, actually arguing that this project is far more than uh, an intellectual project of, I don't know, a hundred uh, university uh, graduates. That this is something that resonates with the young generation of Polish Jews because they need that kind of re reinforcement, emotional reinforcement and factual reinforcement. So when uh, Jan Jakub Szatsky writes about the role of Jewish historians after the war, he it talks about them being the ammunition bearers for the for the Jewish masses. So, so this past becomes an ammunition in a struggle, uh, in a struggle for rights, in a struggle for for civic uh, recognition of of the place of the Jews. And Mahler, Raphael Mahler, uh, Ringelblum's. Uh, close friend and associate who does leave Poland before the war and continues an illustrious career uh, at Tel Aviv University, uh, he calls uh, Jewish historians Wegweiser, right? They are the guides. So uh, I think that this is, that you just nailed uh, why, uh, why this history resonates, because it is not purely factual, it is uh, rolled with emotional, uh, um, emotional uh, um, meaning. Uh, um, now, how this goes together with a sense of historians' own pride, uh, pride in their um, professionalism, uh, I think this is very important. And, um, and this is why uh, they take such uh, uh, pride in publishing or being published in Polish journals, even if they were criticized. And I think that also you touched on something. I was surprised at how, um, how mean some of the reviews were uh, of the work of Polish Jewish historians, suggesting, for example, that they really don't know Latin and they have no idea what they're translating. And I think that there is, there is more going on here than just academic discussion of, you know, how good your um, medieval Latin is. Uh, um, this is. This is whether you belong 
to the, this uh, ivory tower club of professionalism or not. But as you were talking, what, what also became apparent to me, although the book is not uh, written uh, with the shadow of the Holocaust, or this was really a very conscious effort on my part, uh, not to not to overwhelm uh, the text and my my encounter with these uh, uh, women and men, um, but I think that it re it um, returns uh, after the war in uh, Jewish historians' discussions about the need for um, objectivity in writing the history of the destruction. And these are historians that come from this project, such as Philip uh, Friedman. Um, I think it, there is an interesting line of continuity of, uh, and, and they write about it, even though our hearts are uh, full with, with sorrow, uh, we need to restrain ourselves because we are professional historians. We have tools, we have methodological approaches, and this is after all um, a, an academic project. Uh, so I think you, you actually created one more bridge uh, for the question of continuity um, that matters. Now, in terms of my own, um, uh, my own effect, uh, uh, I'll just say that um, it, was a, it was an interesting trajectory because I, I guess as a professional historian who took an, on a project until I almost finished it, I absolutely insisted to myself uh, that this was a purely academic project uh, and that it, it had nothing to do with some kind of um, a factual uh, um, challenge. Um, but it is uh, obviously uh, profoundly uh, uh, personal, uh, also because I studied with people who had studied with people that my historians had studied with. Um, I went to the same library. Um, I looked at, um, at their student files in the university where my own student file is deposited somewhere. Uh, so uh, yes, there is, a, there is a degree to which uh, this is um, um, somewhat uh, of an emotional project of, of very conscious uh, discussion of of this cohort and and their um, and their encounters with uh, with history writing. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, just before I will turn to to Martin, I wanted to say that if someone has a question from the audience, uh, please put a question mark or a queue into the chat, so that we know that you have a question. And now I'm turning to Martin, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Natalia, for your presentation and Naomi for the comments and question. I will follow the same pattern and I'll start with some uh, explanation how I see importance of this book. This is a great book of great importance. I want to say why I believe it is so. But since I'm from Poland, um, East European, I, will, I need to complain a bit too. So I will finish with uh, three questions that I want uh, uh, to bring some. Uh, a new perspective for you, Natalia, to, to reconsider. And this is actually continuing our discussion we had before, and I'm sure we'll have much more to, to, to debate about this very important book. So as I say, the book is extremely important, and I see at least three main areas at which this importance can be captured. First, it shows Polish Jewish history, as uh, somebody said, uh, distinctively Jewish and quintessentially Polish. It's possibly the best. Uh, uh, example of what you can do with inter uh, integral history. You don't write history of Poles and Jews separately, but you show the Polish Jewish history that is actually in one. You cannot separate it. You cannot write, you, you couldn't have written this history without Poland, and you couldn't have written history of Polish history department without this part, right? And this book is showing how strongly they are interconnected. And this is uh, possibly uh, one of the best, or maybe the, the single, the best example of what you do with this concept of doing history. And I will not quote Kuba Goldberg here, no worries, all we know the quote, but this is how it fulfills itself. So I see this is the first one. Second one, already mentioned here, Naomi pointed to this, uh, Natalia also, 
uh, David Mayers pointed to this issue also in what a week ago or something in, in discussion with you is about this connection to Wissenschaft as Judaism. And this, the history of Jewish historiography in kind of a dominant perspective is oversimplified by the perspective of kind of dominant influence on the, of the Wissenschaft des Judentums and all other developments happening in the 19th and 20th century in the shape of this giant intellectual endeavor. And your book is showing there is obvious contact with German tradition, but it's, it's not only independent in the sense that the, we in a parochial way do it different, but it is fully autonomous in, in a kind of intellectual maturity. And that's something that is extremely important and is also corrective to our understanding of history of Jewish historiography in this sense. And third one, which is connected to the above two, is about showing great importance of innovative nature of Polish Jewish historiography, especially if you go into the aspects of methodologies, which will refer to my questions to you later on. But if you look on methodology of the younger historical, and if you ask how innovative their use of uh, Marxism was, what kind of new questions it brought for them, right? Is Bauerban innovative or he's not? If you look at certain elements of his method in separation, say the, 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 the beginnings of the social history, interest in material history, interest in art history aspects, everyday history, everything you can find before Bauerban, but he's maybe the first one, and surely the first one in Jewish history, to put them together into one integrated narrative. And to me, this is kind of a synthetical kind of a, a, new way of looking on the historical method that is very uh, uh, unique and it's, it's at the same time it's very different from what this new cohort of younger historical develops at this uh, a bit later right a generation later they in contact he's their teacher they are methodologically very independent but at the same time they refer to something that i believe was methodologically innovative so I think your book is showing this innovation. It shows how important in, in developing new concepts of how to do Jewish history or how to do history in general uh, could be. But as I say, I'm from Eastern Europe, so now the, a bit of criticism, right? A bit of, of, but actually it's not a criticism. I want to ask questions about how farther from the book you could go, right? And the, the first one that I already mentioned to you before is about um, uh, putting um, boundaries. And the most obvious boundary that you put in your book is historiography. It's in the title of the book. You do it historians, but you do it by our standards, by standards of people in the 21st century that we are different than ethnographers or art historians. We have different methods, we have different workshops, we have different research questions. But then the beginning of the late 19th or the beginning of the 20th century, it is not. Ethnographers is not a different species. It's the same group, the same cohort of of scholars. And if you don't put in the same group Bauerban and Lilian Talova, if you don't put Segal, if you don't put Henrik Lev and all other ethnographers of this time, you get your picture that it is not complete in a sense. And Lilian Talova is the best the, the, to mention here because it, it, it leads me to my second question about women. And the book is excellent on putting emphasis on women. You say third of the students were women. But in a sense, your book, uh, I believe, is it's not doing justice to this third, in a sense that it is kind of compensatory because it's showing how important they were, but it does not show oppression put on them. Because you say third of them were, were uh, female. But my question is, how many of the articles published by this cohort were by women and not men? How many positions within this group or outside were held by women? So in other words, it's not only about how many they are there, but also what is the internal and external structure of women within this circle? And I think this group is to a wide extent replicating the same leaking uh, uh, pipe uh, uh, scheme. The more prestigious positions, the fewer women they are there. So in this sense, this is not exception. Even if they are numerous at the bottom level, they are not so further on. And third one is about methodologies, which I already mentioned. 
is my question about again about Marxism. I'm fascinated with this Marxism, which I think you didn't do justice to, in a sense that you responded to their Marxists in uh, in a debate about how uh, their ideology, I mean the worldviews, influenced their historical workshop. But I think you could go further and ask what it changed in their workshop in questions they ask, how much it made them innovative, exactly Davka, because they were Marxists and they asked different questions than other historians. They were more rigorous about putting certain interpretative uh, schemes on, on the material they, uh, they analyzed. So I would like you to uh, um, uh, give us more on how, how you see this. Uh, again, have I said that this is a great book? I would like to say it again. And, and the, the, the great book has great title. And you know, if, uh, if in uh, 100 years time, people will call you by the title of your book, I think you've chosen best. You'll be the conscious historian, right? Uh, uh, as, the, as the Jewish tradition is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, so much. And I, I, and I need to give credit. Uh, Jan, I, I will respond with your permission. Um, I, I need to give the credit for the title to uh, uh, the one and only Connie Weber of uh, Litman Library for Jewish Civilization. Uh, as we were talking about what this book should be titled, uh, and I had, uh, I actually had a different favorite. Um, I thought of Paper Wars uh, because I was focusing on the the co com combative uh, aspect of history writing and uh, the kind of uh, tool that it it was, and especially that so many of the participants in this project uh, used. Uh, that militant uh, um, metaphors of, uh, yes, uh, um, uh, ammunition, sword, uh, uh, waging a war for Jewish rights. Uh, but, I, but I do think that uh, Connie came up truly with, uh, with the best uh, title. Now, um, I agree, uh, uh, Martin, with all your compliments, so I won't go into them, uh, meaning um, uh, I, I agree especially with that note of um, uh, Vicente of the Judentums, which, which continues to be held uh, as some kind of a measuring stick, as some kind of a, a, a perfect model of a, of a meter. Um, and, uh, and that even though um, uh, Chaim Gertner and some other scholars actually pushed this envelope saying, well, uh, Shmuel Feiner, th there were many more traditions um, and, and trajectories in, uh, in, in this project. But, I, but I, uh, I do hope that my book will show uh, what you said, this kind of self-conscious, mature uh, and dynamic um, um, variation uh, in its own uh, right about uh, the boundaries. So uh, I absolutely agree that the uh, interdisciplinarity that we all aspire to today, but uh, are often very much um, um, locked in our um, professional specialties, in our disciplinary specialties, that there might be even more of that uh, crossing and, and mutual um, inspiration. And Bauerband certainly had a great respect for uh, Lilian Talova uh, and that kind of research uh, that uh, she, uh, she engaged in. Uh, and it has even more um, institutional uh, aspect. Uh, um, there is no Institute of History until later on. Uh, my students, uh, as it were, study in a department of um, humanities. It is to some extent um, mixing and they take classes in sociology. Uh, the Junger Historica seminar uh, includes uh, students who actually study uh, pedagogy and journalism. So yes, it's not that uh, pristine as the book might, uh, might suggest. Um, some of that uh, boundary drawing uh, that this book uh, um, 
engaged in, I must say, is pragmatic and practical. I had to draw the line somewhere. And just like uh, the question of uh, the conversation and the mutual um, intellectual uh, influence uh, of ethnographers, um, I was very interested in what sociology does for this literature, especially uh, for the students interested in writing truly contemporary history, meaning uh, early 20th century history. Um, so generation uh, of their parents' experiences. Um, and that's also leading us to a conversation about a competing uh, project, institutionalized project, uh, EVO in Vilna, which precisely put a focus on those other aspects, right? In, uh, in researching the Jewish, uh, Eastern European Jewish universe. Uh, so I agree with you and, and I hope that, uh, you know, there will be a, an article, there will be a, maybe another doctoral dissertation uh, that will turn into a book. Um, um, Karolina Szymaniak, who, who uh, uh, works uh, in your uh, fantastic uh, institute and uh, Anna Engelking are working on uh, this integrated uh, history of uh, ethnography in which um, Jewish, Polish, ethnic Polish, uh, Belarusian uh, scholars of that generation are collaborating, uh, engaging in conversation. So there is, there is more that needs to be done. And I admit um, that uh, I drew the line somewhat artificially. About uh, women, you have uh, absolutely uh, a right that uh, the book, uh, uh, focuses on noting their, their emergence as a, as a very new cohort. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is again a conversation with David Myers and possibly another book that may uh, get written, uh, there is no parallel if in that kind of cohort, let's say among German Jews, uh, of, of an influx of women who want to pursue uh, German Jewish history. Uh, so as, as to uh, their marginalization, I must say, I simply don't, didn't have the kinds of sources that would allow me to discuss, uh, to discuss it as well as uh, it should be. I'm assuming what you're saying is true, uh, although, uh, it has more to do with who is being remembered. That's why I put on, the, on my presentation the lovely picture of Bella Mandelsberg, uh, because she was a co-founder of Junger Historiker Kreis, of the seminar, but uh, the seminar is usually uh, recalled in the context of the student activities of Ringel, Bloom and Mahler, but she was there as well. Uh, if you look, uh, if we look at the list of participants, certainly incomplete list of participants that Mahler uh, put together of the participants of the seminar, uh, he gives short bios of men and women. And so it's hard to understand from this um, recollection uh, what was the gender dynamic in this group. And if we were to look at the publications, uh, there are publications by women members of the of the group in um, in Blätterfahrt Geschichte in a journal that they. Uh, Natalia, put and what about peer reviews? Do you have any peer reviews? Because with Lienta uh, it was very spectacular what Bauerban wrote for peer reviews about her, and it's so patriarchal you can't even believe. Yes. Showing respect to her in public, but when writing review of what she did. It, it, it was That's a good question. See, I was, um, I was, uh, I was always thinking of his um, um, tone of elegant condescension uh, more in the disciplinary context and less in the context of her being a woman. But you might be onto something. I, again, you might be onto something because the peer reviews, the mutual reviewing that I've uh, cited in a book. Um, and I had a lot of fun uh, uh, searching for those, were men writing about uh, the work of men. Um, so maybe this, this is also an expression of some implicit uh, uh, marginalization. Uh, but 
but again, uh, this is something I would love to know more. I um, I think there there is maybe a, a way to push this uh, emergence of women uh, to push a little further and see um, see more about it. Um, I'm also very curious about the personal price that they may have uh, paid for uh, their professional um, engagement, professional activism, although this also went often together with their political engagement. Bella Mandelsberg was uh, uh, active in Palazion left and she was married to a Palazion left activist. Is there a so, sort of a subculture that we can also look at the way that uh, uh, historians analyzed uh, the way th that rev revolutionary movements treated women, right? The, the, the culture of Bund vis-a-vis -vis women, the culture of uh, uh, radical Zionism uh, and the way that it treated women who were active and who were, um, yes, who were always somewhat in a, in a background. Uh, so I, uh, I take your criticism really as a call for more research uh, uh, into the subject about Marxism. And indeed we've, we've been having this conversation. Um, I do think that, uh, that it changes a lot. Uh, this is what pushes uh, research into inequality, into class conflict, uh, into um, uh, back to what Naomi said, um, this um, um, non-lacrimose uh, vision of, of Jewish history on the one hand, but also not uh, a, apologetic vision of the Jewish past internally, right? That this is not all beautiful Kehila and uh, autonomy and organizations and uh, uh, various uh, um, uh, traditions uh, that that take care of the poor and the women without dowry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, these are young historians who are revealing uh, uh, deep tensions, uh, um, uh, revealing heart lot of um, Jewish craftsmen vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis community elite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think that where I sort of allowed myself not to go deeper into it was, and it goes back to what you mentioned first, this um, uh, Polish Jewish historiography uh, being uh, profoundly integrated. Um, even if there was a structural anti-Semitism, um, because Samuel Casso, in his uh, fantastic book on uh, Ringelblum and, and the making of Onek Shabbat, pays particularly close attention. I believe that the title of the chapter is uh, Borochov's Disciples. And, and he pays close attention to how Borochov's, uh, Ber Borochov's writings, including his Marxism, how it uh, uh, re reflected into uh, the work of Ringelblum and other uh, young historians. So I was actually uh, particularly interested in uh, showing that they are just as much disciples of um, Handelsmann and, and Stanislav Arnold. So I was I was pushing this uh, this analysis into the the discourse of intellectual uh, stimulus coming from Polish historiography. But you're right, Marxism is very, very important, especially uh, in the 30s and, and especially in the context of, of the uh, profound uh, economic crisis uh, on top of political crisis that Naomi uh, mentioned. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, so now I'm inviting everyone to join the discussion. Uh, as I said before, if you have a question, you can write a Q, uh, question mark, or you can raise a hand, or you can basically make any movement that makes you recognizable as a person who wants to ask a question. Uh, but when we are waiting for it, I might have, I have two questions. I will ask the first one, and then if there is time, I will ask the second one. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking this question as a person who didn't read the book and who is also not a specialist in, in Polish Jewish history and also not in Jewish history at, at all. Uh, but I'm very interested in the question of how innovation comes into life and how it travels. Uh, and I was wondering, because you told us a lot about innovation within uh, Polish Jewish historiography, 
And I was exactly wondering if you can say a bit more about what kind of innovation it was, because as I understood, it's uh, the first one is the innovation that uh, the Jewish history becomes the part of the Polish Jewish history or a shared history. Uh, then there is also uh, the movement to include the local history and everyday life. Uh, so it's a more or less like geographical and topical one. Uh, but I was also wondering whether there is uh, like epistemic innovation, which comes uh, like, for example, new categories, uh, for also about categories to speak about the entangled, about the common pasts of, of, uh, uh, in, within the region. And then the, the second part of the question is, uh, does this innovation actually then translate into the, let's, let's call it Polish Polish historiography or, or mainstream Polish or national Polish historiography? Uh, or is it as very often happens with innovative historiography that it becomes a part of an institute or like even not within an institute, but then it's maybe it's read, but it's not quoted. Uh, so exactly was it like, you know, in parallel or was it in a, in a, in a dialogue with, with the Polish Polish historiography? Uh, thank you. This is an afternoon of great questions, uh, really. Um, well, uh, innovation, uh, innovation I, I think that the book is making uh, an argument for two conflicting uh, directions in which this project goes. Um, one is innovation, and I'll come back to it, and another one is continuity. Um, and they, they go to get, they travel together uh, that, um, the scholars active in the interwar Poland um, are certainly aware of what had been written. Uh, they're critical of it, but there is a surprising to me degree to which they continue some of the, some of the important lines of uh, especially what, what you and, and, and Marcin and Naomi had mentioned this inscribing Jewish history into Polish past, this um, uh, constructing of Jewish at home over the centuries uh, in Polish lands. And this is something that, um, that had been alluded to from, from the onset of this uh, historiographical project. Um, it might have been wrapped in all kinds of other pol political claims, but this was not in and of itself, this was not new. What, uh, what I think is um, new, and it's something that, that is obvious, but I will say it anyhow, uh, that this is a project that gets interrupted, right, in the middle of a sentence. There, it doesn't come to a closure because, you know, historiography goes to another um, into another cycle. That um, uh, there is another uh, uh, big uh, um, project that these uh, uh, men and women take on. Uh, so, uh, so I'm a little bit here performing a, a surgery uh, um, that that is interrupted tragically and artificially. Um, even even if uh, uh, there are survivors to this project, then many of them after the war uh, will write about the Holocaust rather than about uh, 17, 18, 19th century Polish Jewish historiography, Polish Jewish past. Uh, but there are three things that come to mind uh, to me as innovative or experimenting with. Uh, one is uh, how do you write about conflict? How, how do you write about conflict and violence? And that goes again back to Naomi's um, uh, poking at Salo Baron and his non lacrimose uh, vision of the Jewish past. And uh, despite what my um, wonderful teacher, uh, David Engel, argues that uh, Salo Baron is really not that connected to that Polish Jewish project. Uh, I think he is. And I think that by looking at what uh, Bauerban and, um, and Friedman and Ringelblum and um, Bella uh, Mandelsberg, right? We see uh, a lot in uh, a lot of, of very important uh, um, understandings of Jewish victimization um, or how Jewish victimization should not be the focus um, um, in, in those bodies of, of work. So uh, 
what is what is interesting is how these Polish Jewish historians take on subjects of uh, of conflict, of violence, of anti-Jewish violence, and how they work these incidents. Uh, again, back Naomi to what you said that those incidents should not be taken as reflecting um, the general uh, the general experience of the diaspora, um, and and this this is very similar to I think how uh, many of historians of Jewish diasporic experience have been writing about it in the 1990s and 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 uh, and since. Uh, I don't think that they are unconsciously, as it were, inspired by Bawaban, but but uh, it's uh, it's it's innovative because they write about conflict uh, and violence in an increasingly uh, uh, violent times uh, in terms of verbal uh, this discursive violence, symbolic violence, and physical violence. But they're extremely ca cautious uh, in. Uh, looking into the past to sort of meet in that experience of the 1930s. Um, the second uh, aspect that I consider uh, innovative is a very uh, mature reflection on sources. Um, it's, uh, it goes far beyond the lip service of, oh, we need to use both Jewish and non-Jewish sources. They really do do dive into deep into Polish uh, archival collections and into uh, communal rec uh, records and try to write this integrative and integrated history also in terms of uh, the, the basis for, uh, for their claims. And then what I think is also innovative, although it might have their parallels in other uh, Jewish uh, and not necessarily only Jewish projects of uh, communal history writing, which is how do you create a field? Um, because they are, uh, they see themselves as part of the broader uh, story of uh, Wiesenschaft des Judentums, a la Polonaise, uh, Polish style, but, uh, but they are really as Polish Jewish history, they're writing uh, something almost from scratch as professional historians. Uh, so all these reflections, all these discussions that are alluded to on how do, how do you exactly do it? And especially how do you exactly do it when you don't have a state support uh, for it, which is part of why uh, the seminar is created, why they want to have a journal uh, in Yiddish for that kind of research. So, so that would be uh, that would be some of the directions uh, that um, I would take it to. Thank you. Uh, still waiting for questions from the audience, and uh, no pressure. And also Naomi and and Martin, if you have questions, you can also add them. Uh, of course, uh, but if there is no one who wants to add a question, oh, we, we have Jan Rybak now, uh, so please, Jan. Yeah, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. Um, I have uh, two questions mainly. So the first would be, um, and you mentioned that briefly in your last reply, um, those who survived the Holocaust and continue to work as historians, um, you mentioned that they are shifting their attention towards working on the Holocaust itself. Do they reflect on their earlier works? So I'm thinking, of course, about David Engel's uh, um, book on, on uh, the historians of the Jews and the Holocaust. Uh, what about um, them, or the people that you're working on? Are they reconsidering their findings about um, earlier Polish Jewish history in light of, uh, of, of the Holocaust? <clears throat> and the second question would relate to um, the international context uh, of the time. So you mentioned that they situate themselves uh, to a large extent in, or they relate themselves to the, the business of the Judentums, but also in the, in the 20s and, and early 30s, um, in several countries you have these other waves and historiographic debates. Um, for example, the, the, the discussions over the Anal um, um, schools in France and so on, and, and other questions, social history becoming more important. Are they relating to these um, international discussions or generally with uh, are they relating internationally to other scholars in other countries and 
If mm. so, where to? Is it to the US? Is it to, to, to Germany before 33? Is it to the Hebrew University? What are there? Is it to, to, to the Soviet Union um, in some cases? So is that, yeah, how, how do they situate themselves? Or are they situated in, in an international scholarly context? This is such a, this, these are great questions. And uh, I know that um, I should not take another hour with this, but let me just point to, uh, point to some, uh, some elements. So uh, with regard to um, rethinking of that body of literature from the perspective of their experience, uh, I haven't found any explicit uh, revisiting, not, uh, not in terms of published work and not even in private correspondence. Uh, and um, I had looked at um, uh, Michael Gelber's collection and Philip Friedman's collection, um, and they were engaged in, in a conversation um, on, on a page uh, with, um, with, with this entire uh, community, as it were, uh, that became scattered uh, internationally. Some staying in Poland, some leaving, some uh, leaving already, uh, living already abroad uh, before the war. Um, it's more uh, an issue of uh, of a sense of a of calling uh, that is uh, something that they cannot uh, put aside. Uh, that this is. It, uh, this is it particularly strong uh, in in the case of Friedman and uh, Eisenbach uh, in their correspondence, um, but not everybody falls for it, uh, falls for it, for it as it were, right? I mean, Mahler continues writing about uh, Hasidism and, and Haskalah. He does not become the historian of the destruction. Um, I yeah, it's a great question. I don't think I don't think that anyone does that kind of accounting for, you know, I was wrong in my optimism, right? We, we should have, that there should have been more uh, of the lacrima, lacrimosity. Uh, in fact, again, this is back to Naomi's great question about effect and objectivity and that kind of restraining oneself as a professional man slash woman. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, a lot of in this uh, project of uh, writing the destruction, writing writing the Horban, is is of the of the um, uh, keeping in mind, uh, you know, the, the the gentiles who helped, keeping in mind the good things that happened, uh, not 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 in in the in terms of the Holocaust, but you know the gestures, the the assistance, the people who uh, who resisted the temptation of uh, profiting from. So so it's it's uh, it's very restrained. Uh, in that sense of, you know, giving a, an objective view of what happened, rather than using history as a as a as a venue for personal mourning and and rage. Again, back Naomi to your uh, to your vocabulary of of affect. Um, but but this is a great question, and if I ever come across. Uh, this reevaluation, this would be very interesting to see. Uh, but uh, again, to David Engel's question, to David Engel's book, since you brought it up, um, it's also interesting. I ask myself now uh, whether any of them formulate formulate this idea that you know Jewish history is, includes the Holocaust. This is part of Jewish history, and I. And I think so. I mean, again, Friedman has this very early uh, formulation that there is a, 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 a Nazi-centric, German-centric kind of history of the Holocaust, and then there is Judeo-centric, and it's very important that that Jewish historians, um, not only in that at this moment professional, but those documenting ensure that the history of the destruction doesn't become the history of perpetrators. Uh, so again, there is that um, formulation of claiming this experience as part of Jewish history as well. Um, and, to the, and to the question of international um, impulses, uh, great question. I don't, I don't know uh, really uh, 
again, would be interesting to look at the material with that question in mind. I don't, I don't remember uh, seeing much of a discussion about American um, context. Uh, um, I think that the Soviet context is very problematic and back to Martin's uh, questions about ethnographers, uh, you know, some of Jewish ethnographers learn the hard way that uh, any kind of uh, intellectual discussion across the eastern border can easily be then used against them, accusing them of uh, of communism. Uh, so I think that there is a there there, there would be a great deal of res restraint in expressing this uh, in writing. I don't have the protocols of the meeting, so I can only work with what has been uh, published. Hebrew University is certainly important, and uh, there is a project of creating a chair in Polish Jewish history that uh, Polish consulate in uh, Jerusalem supports uh, wholeheartedly. And there is a whole discussion in the Polish Foreign Office files. Um, uh, who would be the the person and yes, Martin, who would be the guy uh, to uh, to take uh, to to be worthy of this position? Uh, and the obvious candidates are brought up, but nothing comes out of it uh, due to many uh, uh, issues. And I think also general lack of uh, enthusiasm uh, among the Jerusalem School historians. Um, there is uh, there is a, a great deal of collecting with. Uh, Hebrew University um, in mind, collecting of material, sending books. So th there are there are links, um, and Anal uh, definitely. And I don't want to sound too polonocentric, but this is also happening through the filter of Polish historians who are um, Handelsman, Arnold, others. Uh, they are very much interested in this approach and and. This is happening in Polish historiography more broadly. But uh, but yes, about the, the American aspect, I need to think about it. It's a great question. I was, I must say, I was focused on seeing or not seeing the Soviet and or French uh, French references. If I can very lightly continue on this thread, uh, I actually wanted to ask what were the relation of Polish Jewish historians with, for instance, with, with historians of other minorities within within Second Polish Republic, oh. Lithuanians, uh, yeah. Ukrainians, especially because it's also uh, more or less also a lot is happening in Lviv, so at the shared university in. in uh, so could you tell me? Yeah, well, another great question. And another great question that I wish could I could say more. I was very interested, especially in the relationship with Ukrainian historians, because of how many of, uh, of those uh, 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 men and women are uh, from Galicia. Uh, so they, for them, it would have been uh, biographically, a very uh, real, tangible experience, uh, also um, at university uh, and in academic uh, circles, and also in the context of local histories. I haven't found um, any, almost anything. I can, I can give you two pieces that I put together, um, and we can, you know, we can ask ourselves uh, how much we can make uh, um, out of those two pieces. One is uh, Marceli Handelsman, when he brings Meyer Bauerban to uh, Warsaw University to teach Polish Jewish history as a professor uh, in 1927, he also brings a Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian historian of Ukrainian history uh, in Polish lands, Miron Korduba. And, uh, and so this is clearly a project of um, Polish history understood in a civic sense as Polish history, not, not history written by ethnic Poles about ethnic Poles. But I haven't found any trace of um, professional uh, um, conversation uh, between the two. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist. I just, you know, the 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 whole uh, private archive of Meyer Bauerban doesn't exist. Uh, there is just a handful of things that were uh, um, somehow preserved in a, 
um, collection of Krakow Jewish community that through the storms of, of the war ended up at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And so, for example, you can find there an invitation to the wedding of Meyer Balaban's daughter, uh, but no, no correspondence with Ukrainian uh, scholars. As far as uh, Lvov Lviv is concerned, he is in contact with, um, uh, with Polish historians in Lvov. I haven't seen um, uh, Wucja Harewiczowa, which goes to the, again to Martin's question about women. She's one of very few women in Polish uh, historiographical historical circles that kind of has that uh, position, a uh, strong position in a, in a field. Um, and the second piece is there is a, a international conference of historical studies in Warsaw uh, in 1934. Uh, Jewish historians, because of likely um, some Caso agrees here with me, but neither of us found a smoking gun uh, that it must have been Handelsman who enabled uh, organizing a session on Jewish history that is manned, and again, manned quite literally by men only, uh, by Jewish, uh, Polish Jewish historians and Jewish historians from abroad, such as uh, uh, Baron, who was invited. Um, and Jewish press writes reports from it and mentions a Ukrainian historian present, uh, but doesn't say whether he asked a question, what question would it be? So uh, um, again, it's a huge, it's a huge question. Uh, to what extent there is something parallel to minority block in a parliament, right? You know, minorities coming together to demand certain treatment uh, from the from the um, Polish uh, uh, majority in the nation state um, and, and historians banding to, coming together to, to, to oppose a, a nationalist uh, historiogra historiographical um, 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 longings. I haven't, I haven't found it, but again, um, Maybe maybe a dissertation is being right now written about it that we don't know of. It would be uh, fascinating to see it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I do also hope that uh, dissertations in this direction will be written. I mean, I know that the Polish historiography, uh, the, the Ukrainian historiography in Poland is now getting more interest uh, and hopefully something will come uh, in this direction. Uh, and uh, now we have another question from uh, Cornelia Concho. Hey, good evening, thank you. Um, um, you mentioned a couple of times uh, the lacks and gaps in archival material, but I'd like to ask a question in a positive way. What was the most um, surprising archival finding that you came across? Oh, oh, thank you for this question. Uh, this is great. Uh, it gives me a chance to actually um, uh, bring something that is connected to a lot of the conversation we had so far. So in the um, uh, central archives of the history of the Jewish people in Jerusalem, uh, the archive with the longest uh, name <laughs> ever, uh, um, in the collection of um, uh, Michael Gelber, who was another Galicianer, um, well, in his case with a degree as well from Vienna, um, uh, I found a, a calendar, uh, and here I need to uh, thank uh, Rachel Manekin, who, uh, who made me aware of its existence and made sure that I was able to see it. Um, so uh, this was a calendar from uh, Gelber's visit to Poland. Gelber, after his uh, uh, immigration, Aliyah to uh, Mandatory Palestine, was working on behalf of um, uh, uh, Karen Kayemet uh, Jewish National Fund, and he was traveling to Poland to Schnorr to get Jews donate for the Zionist enterprise. And uh, on one of his visits, now when he went, he noted in the calendar, I guess the way we still do, I, I'm still using a paper calendar, probably the last person, um, uh, whatever was happening. So he noted about his conversation with Bawaban and that goes to the um, 
again, lacrim lacrimose uh, um, um, past and lacrimose present and optimism uh, that is sort of running out of uh, one out of itself. Uh, he noted that Bawaban uh, is feeling very down and thinks that uh, the situation in Poland will uh, uh, very soon follow what's happening in Germany. This is obviously after Hitler's rise to power. And he thinks that, writes Gelber, that, uh, uh, that Poland will make not only uh, shechita, ritual slaughter, uh, illegal, but will also make uh, circumcision illegal. And that's, that's it. Um, but uh, it, gives, uh, it gave me an insight into the kind of rethinking of the place uh, and the future um, that, uh, that the intellectuals were having vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the increasingly dire situation. And this is something that uh, didn't quite get um, uh, to be expressed in, in, in writing. Uh, it also touches on what uh, Jan uh, asked earlier, you know, what kinds of histories would they have written uh, in 1940? right in 1941 and they were writing but um, but uh, much of this work uh, was destroyed uh, we we know that bella mandelsberg wrote in uh, lublin ghetto uh, we we know um, that bauerban continued working and in fact uh, there is an account of his secretary uh, who was typing um, he was dictating her uh, the next book um, so so we can we can really only say uh, it would be fascinating to see. Um, but yes, this this tiny calendar I think was my favorite favorite found find and and mysterious because it's the kind of note that you know you wish uh, he had written a little more. Uh, you know, can you please give me a quote? Don't don't just say Bawaban thinks. Um, a quote would be lovely, but. Um, it was interesting to see it. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, since I saw that uh, Irina uh, turned the camera on, I suppose you have a question. Yes. Hi, Irina. Hi, Natalia. Um, this, this has been great, even though I had my picture on rather than I was listening intensely. Um, I haven't yet read the book, but um, <clears throat> I will because it sounds totally fascinating. And I have um, many questions, but let me just ask one. Um, this group of historians that, that you've taken such a deep dive into, um, how unique do you think it was in Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, let's say, East of Germany? Um, do you think there is such a rich generationally structured, um, gender structured, um, mm -hmm. school structured um, group. Probably, I mean, as I'm as I'm making my question, I I'm already envisioning the answer um, as there was in Poland, in Hungary, or in Romania. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit of what I am thinking. Of course, the, the Polish Jewry was so much bigger than anywhere else that probably that and the, and the sort of the cultural richness of, of Polish Jewry may have had something to do with the historiographic landscape as well, but I'm I'm curious if you've thought about that sort of comparison. Mm. I, I thought about it, but just like with uh, ethnographers, I had to draw the line somewhere. Otherwise, this book would have never, oh, yeah. no, <laughs> would have I, never been finished. No, no, but totally. uh, but this is uh, this is uh, this is an important question, and and I must note also that it's interesting because as you were asking, I kept on thinking to myself. Hmm, Minsk, Kiev, Kaunas, and then you specified Hungary and Romania. So it's also interesting where 
uh, where our thoughts go uh, when when Eastern Europe as a Jewish Eastern Europe as a notion is being uh, being uh, mentioned. But I will start with uh, with what came to my mind as Eastern sure. Europe, and then go to your part. Uh, although I, I actually would be uh, uh, very curious. Uh, to to learn from you about the uh, Romanian landscape. So um, I actually don't know uh, about the uh, Lithuanian uh, uh, um, situation, and it would certainly be something worth exploring because there is a state-sponsored right network of schools, uh, state-sponsored uh, cultural activities uh, uh, over. Uh, over, with the oversight of the uh, Jewish ministry. Uh, so it makes actually, it would make perfect sense that there is a project of writing Lithuanian Jewish history, uh, especially that Lithuania as an independent state has a huge Polish chip uh, on, on its shoulder yes. as, it, as it is, right? There is an ongoing conflict about Vilna. So it would, it would intellectually, politically be uh, 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 seem like uh, the right thing to do. And, uh, and I, uh, I would love to actually read something uh, about it. Uh, in terms of the Soviet context, uh, there has been work done by uh, Deborah Yellen and, and Elisa Benporat on the intellectual projects that are taking place in Minsk and Kiev. And uh, here, Martin's earlier question about Marxism becomes particularly uh, pertinent, uh, you know, the extent to which these intellectuals are maneuvering what yeah. is sayable, what is printable, uh, you know, what you can uh, research. And there is certainly a lot of, again, from what I read of their uh, fascinating research on the subject, um, there is a lot of parallels with what Ringelblums and, and Mandelsberg and, and, uh, and uh, Mahler uh, do. Uh, everyday life, social conflict, class conflict, uh, you know, the struggle for uh, the poor, uh, the poor craftsmen uh, and the uh, abusive uh, Kahila, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the stress, at least in the 1920s, is on uh, Yiddish uh, uh, Yiddish, production of knowledge in Yiddish about it and the shtetl and, and now shtetl as a site of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish culture, but now shtetl overgoing this dramatic change. Um, so it would be interesting to compare it. Um, I don't think that it has been done, uh, but, but I think that there are enough lines that would, uh, that would invite that kind of comparison. Um, about Hungary, there's a great book uh, by Guy Miron, uh, and um, it's, it's fascinating how many of the key points of that historiography for Hungary is similar, or maybe it, it shouldn't be surprising, it was to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the context seems, uh, political context seems so, uh, so different, uh, but it is about uh, inserting Jews into um, into Hungarian uh, history, you know, this whole Magyar uh, um, uh, cultural uh, affinity and the contribution of Jews to, you know, everything, right? To Hungarian struggle for independence, to Hungarian culture, to Hungarian economy, et cetera, et cetera. So this apologetic uh, presentist uh, uh, declaration of of patriotic uh, Im embeddedness in the past is, mm -hmm. is very very similar. Um, but my Hungarian um, is non-existent, so I <laughs> I have to rely I have to rely here on on Guy uh, on Guy Miron's findings. Um, now about Romania. Th this is a, really a question to you. I wonder if there is if there is that kind of intellectual project uh, as Romania has now new borders. There is a new community to include in this account of the past. So, you know, I am coming up empty. Um, there, there are certainly Jewish cultural projects, um, but one of one of them is assimilationist. Uh, so there you don't get much. 
a lot of the historiographic projects of the Romanian historians are very nationalistic. Mm. Um, and um, some of them, you know, going to the issue of ethnography, for example, uh, try to skip over medieval history because there is nothing there in documents. So let's go to antiquity and pre-antiquity because that's where you find the Dacians, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I don't, I mean, this does not mean that there are not um, Jewish um, archivists and Jewish historians working in Yiddish and, you know, I'm just not aware mm -hmm. of any um, modern historians who have done the work on that. And so that would be a fantastic project that could yet take another root. book that needs to be written and uh, and yeah. could have your book as a model. The, no, but it would be fascinating to see actually whether there is uh, there is any comparable idea for and, and, and especially I'm thinking, you know, just again, um, just on the purely uh, um, guessing uh, a level. Uh, there is a there is a substantial population that has Galician roots, right? So uh, um, whether or not this this model uh, gets uh, gets imported uh, across the border, um, uh, yeah, uh, I I would love to have uh, um, a, a historian yeah. take up. This you give project. me you're giving me ideas, but I don't have time. <laughs> You have brilliant students, so. <laughs> thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Irina. I, I really hope that there are some students who will who are either listening now or will watch to the video, uh, because there is yes. like I think I noted five or six ideas for uh, books or PhD projects. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and uh, now, since since we are slowly but inevitably running out of time. I wanted to ask uh, Naomi and Martin if you have any uh, final comments. I don't. Uh, I said it's a great book and I don't think there's anything more to say at this stage. <laughs> I love the summary, Martin. Thank you very much. I think when Martin says something, he basically covers it all, which is it's a good thing I went before him. Very nice to see you all. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming uh, when the world is coming back to um, activities beyond Zoom. And thank you, Jan, for the invitation. Yeah, thank you also, uh, yeah. Natalia, uh, Naomi, yeah. and Martin for the discussion. And uh, yeah, exactly. If you have more questions, please by the book, which is there exactly behind <laughs> me. Uh, and uh, hope to see you soon, either on Zoom or hopefully live in the next discussion. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye.